I have no idea what I'm doing. Hey folks, Masako X here, and wait, this is a Dragon Ball I hear you say. Well, you're right. I also have no background knowledge about this series, Dragon Quest, except for the fact that Toriyama had something to do with designing the characters back in the day. So I thought it might be fun, and also in practicing for a future anime review show potentially, that I go into this series with little to no knowledge about this and learn about it as we go along and maybe play some of the games in my downtime to gain some intel and context. Anyway, I hope you'll be patient with me and that it may bring you some scope into the wonders of Dragon Quest The Adventure of Dai if you haven't previously done so. As you might be able to tell, this is going to be in a similar format to my Dragon Ball Super reviews, but do bear with me. I may get some things wrong, I may gloss over things, but I'm going to review it as somebody who's going into this new, as I'm sure some of you may be. And if you're not, and you know the series inside and out, and the franchise, then perhaps this might give you a fresh perspective from somebody totally new to it. Or maybe it might completely drive you mad. But anyway, let's go. Episode 1, Die the Tiny Hero. You're not kidding. But already the similarity to Dragon Ball is paramount because Goku was also tiny. We begin with flashbacks of various heroes from the past, defeating the Dark Lord Hadler, before then seeing a man grieving the loss of a young woman, and then a totally not Moses illusion with the young Dai, our hero for proceedings, washing up on the shore of an island with all the creatures of the land, taking the little lad in, and not eating him. Very convenient, I find. If that were reality, that babe would be toast, or served on toast, or monster toast. In any case, we then cut to the intro theme and since this is the first episode, we shall cover it here. From what I can tell, the animation and content does provide me with some good background as to what to perhaps expect with Dai, and those monsters being somewhat of cheerleaders for him actually, and completely subverting the genre of monsters being bad, and that this is going to be a part of a three character setup who we will most likely not be yet, but probably meet all of them by episode 4, typical and the idea that this is going to be a big adventure culminating with the final encounter with Hadler. It's good at telling a story in about a minute or so. The music though, it was alright, just a little bit cookie cutter for me, but otherwise pretty decent. It had a good beat to it, but it didn't really get me buzzing. The animation did that for me. Anyway, the main story begins. Now if this series hadn't made it clear enough for you already, this place has plenty of colourful monsters in it, and we are greeted to them with many whirls and swooshes, camera pans going round and round and round, and I can understand why the anime had to slow down the frames a little bit to a chugging pace, because if they were any faster or at the speed intended, I'd have felt pretty queasy. But this all leads to Dai, of course, our leader for the series, with his empathic bond with the creatures. Sort of like Kid Goku with the forest, and how he is a carefree boy with everything going his way. I think you could probably tell I'm going to be comparing it to Dragon Ball a lot. But that is until old Grandpa Brass gets in the way to stop his dawdling. That's the entity that first found him, so therefore that must be his parental guide because, hey, find his keepers. But it becomes clear that Dai isn't all that great at the magic bit that he's supposed to be doing. Okay, I get it. He's a plucky spirit with the desire to coast through life and have fun. You know, being a kid. Why can't anime just let the kids be kids, man? Magic doesn't always have to be dialed in all the time from a young age. Unless it would be made fun of, or kids exploiting the heck out of it. It's apparent though also, that Dai is more focused on being a warrior, wielding swords and shields, fighting off monsters, becoming a hero of strength, rather than being a mage with magical powers solely. The idea of being the hero of legend, like the ones of the past, is the thing that drives him. Okay, I understand that. Personal preference, gotcha. Because of said heroes, the monsters here now live on Domain Island in peace with Dai as their newest resident, but in return has to become a mage to help future heroes out, or protect them. Ah, So Dai is sad because he's not being allowed to dream big and do what he wants, leading, but to act as support. Ah, uh, okay, this is like your typical trope of like, oh I want to go and do this thing. No son, you're going to be doing the same thing again and again. Progress is bad. And of course Dai tried to tell you that that isn't the case. With Dai being cajoled by his not poor slime friend Gome, Dai spots a ship heading for the island. The SS plot device. It brings forth a hero. And of course Dai has to go and meet them because he loves heroes. Isn't that clear enough for you? And um, yeah, most likely get into a trouble. No, wait! 
Oh, it's worse. He's about to have his dreams and fantasies completely torn to sheds, isn't he? This guy. He's a bit of a tosspot. I can tell right away. Total tosspot. This chap is Derolin, and he's not a hero at all, but a thief. He's about to kill the monsters on the island, I bet, for an easy game of fame. Well, no. Well, these monsters are nice. Do you hate this guy already? I hate this guy already. And I've only heard him talk for about 10 seconds. His quest, though, mainly, is for the golden metal slime and... Oh no, how convenient. That's Dai's best friend. Okay, this has been set up nicely. I will give you that. Okay, I'm, I'm being facetious. Dai and Derolin meet and the former mistakes the guy for being a proper hero from the outset without asking or having understanding about social cues. Not everybody's a hero, mate. Luckily, Derolin isn't that smart, and he was about to give the game away immediately, but then the cleric Zerbon, I mean Zerbon, picks up on the ignorance and goes with it. Nice save. And a good way to use Dai's good nature and favour as well, to get immediate access to the island without difficulty gaining research. And using Dai to, of course, get the monsters all in one place, finding the golden slime without having to even look for it. Brass, who actually has smarts, unlike Dai, rats Derelin out almost at once and they start to attack him whilst Dai is grabbing a reluctant Gome, who even is telling Dai he doesn't want to meet them. Jeez, it's like the entire plot is going, Dai, get it through your thick head! These are evil people! I've never seen the plot be so rooting for Dai to get it through his head, but the kid's just bulldozing through it anyway. Well, hey, Maybe the sight of his friends being killed might get it through his thick head. Oh yeah, that did it. Yeah, slicey, slicey. And in the midst of this, of course, Gome ends up being kidnapped by Zerbon and Derelin tries to blow up Brass and escape. But that's actually nothing. Dinah has to go and rescue them. And unlike most mages saying it isn't safe to go, Brass is like, Oh, it's okay, go for it. But uh, take these boomy things and make them suffer, okay? Okay. Ah, right. Grandpa's sort of on board so long as it's got something to do with magic. Okay. Not as cantankerous as I thought. Okay, nice. Despite Dai not knowing magic, the magic cylinders are enough to capture creatures within. So like a Marfleba, or better yet, Dai becomes a Ghostbuster, but with nasty people. Cool. So, <laughs> he's got to test them out. Dai uses them on the mage. Repeatedly. Perhaps he regrets giving to them, right? Okay, I, did, I actually did find that funny. And how he just keeps on doing it, and actually keeps his grandpa in there. That is pretty dense, actually. So while Daryl and his crew are getting praise from King Romos and being called heroes, even though they're not, Dai and his crew are about to join the party and tear it a new one. They claim that Dermlin Island was evil, these people, where it totally wasn't. And they're basically lying about everything. I mean, come on, these guys look evil. Not one bit of them looks nice. But hey, I'm not a king, so what does my opinion matter? But after presenting Gome, Derelin gets the crown of champions as a gift. That is until Dai shows up, claiming that whatever Derelin said was a lie. And the battle is naturally about to begin on the ship. What is this, One Piece? But hey, monsters are by his side too, and giant squids and mermen tipping the ship. Hey, yeah, that's actually good. That would help. Just tip it over entirely. But yeah, Mr. Golem, smash that jerk for me, please. Just do it. I love it. But then the ice powers of the mages of the evil group tip the balance literally back into form and the monsters are now frozen on the spot or blown off the side of the ship to add some peril and tension. Derelion is about to kill Dai, but then the golden cylinders for earlier that Hadler had given to Brass, or he'd found from them, are unleashed. Just slimes. But the other one is a giant dragon! Nice, cool, giant dragon! We like giant dragons here. But then Zerbon, who is clearly the smartest of the group, breaks the illusion of being heroes immediately, giving up, threatening to pen prick Gome, but then the slime comes back in to form a king slime. Ah oh, yes, th that makes sense and it's utterly hilarious. But I will say, I do love the subversion here. You think the giant dragon is going to be the thing that saves the day, but it totally isn't. I mean, it, do it does good stuff, but the king slime just goes and th that's enough. All right, I, I, I appreciate twists like that. But then Derelin is gulped, sure enough, by the cylinder and Gomez freed. But the king realizes also and listens that those other guys were fakes and perhaps the king being told the island distance is dangerous as first thought might be nice and helpful to show that Dermlin Island isn't that bad. So in return, Dai gets the crown of champions instead and called the future hero. Oh, okay. J just give the precious family heirloom handed down for generations to a, to a random kid. All right. Hey, 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 it's better than giving it to a thief. 
But Di doesn't get to wear the crown because Brass feels it's not worth it since he's meant to be a mage, not a hero. Ah, right, that whole shtick. But I guess the events of just now don't count, or maybe they do. So we cut to three months later anyway, and Di has still barely understood how to use magic, but then another ship turns up. Is it a battleship? Is this gonna happen again? No, it's a sacred ship. Off of it exits a sage, who bows to Di and Brass, calling them for their services, thanking of the good words of King Romos, and charging them with protecting Princess Leona, and calling Di a future hero. Well, I mean, I guess he has no choice but to be one, because the characters told him so. But that isn't before Leona calls him tiny and undependable. Ah, uh, okay, we're getting a Trish sort of situation here. But hey, guess he's got to prove himself, and that's where the episode ends. All in all, for a first episode, I understood it. Going into this as a Dragon Ball fan exclusively, I got the gist of what to expect. There are powers in there, but it's nice to see that Dai is not necessarily going to be good at them from the off. To see this kid as somebody who isn't super talented at everything that he gets to is sort of refreshing. Sort of like Goku. I mean, early Goku. He's got raw potential, but has no idea how to use it yet. But he soon will understand it, gaining new party members and friends, understanding not everybody's a hero, aiding him in his quest to becoming the true future hero, like he wanted to. I like the idea also of Derlin and how not all people who claim to be heroes are good. That was really neat to illustrate that right now at the start of the adventure. So Dai knows what to look for and be tempered. I can imagine that his Chirpy optimism of saying everybody's a hero could get really irritating after a while if you thought that every single person out there was a hero. And in terms of the animation and design, I felt it was very well done. The stuff learnt from Dragon Ball Super's filter system that Toei had developed and now uses for One Piece on the regular is excellent. And the style of Dragon Quest definitely lends itself to it. Flowing, organic and immersive, it really makes the monsters pop and feel alive. It grabbed my attention, to say the least. And I'll be doing more of these going forward as part of me learning about Dragon Quest. But what did you folks think? Did this interest you in watching the series? Are you keen to learn more about it or go back to it if you've already seen it? Leave a comment below and let me know. And I shall see you next Friday for another episode review. Catch you later.